what's most fundamental, I believe, is to discover how deeply loved you are by Jesus Christ. I think the greatest songwriters are the ones that have had an encounter that changed them forever. From the shiver of something missing to the fulfillment of every single desire of our human hearts. I can give you advice of how to play, how to sing, how to write, but I feel like those are secondary to what's my most primordial and what's most fundamental and to allow yourself to be loved by Jesus Christ, to discover how deeply loved you are and that Jesus Christ fulfills the deepest desires of the human heart. And what are the desires of the human heart? To be loved, to be affirmed, to be secured, to be safe, to be seen, to be known. Insofar as you're able to understand that, I believe your songwriting will flourish because it's coming from a real concrete place. It's not coming from an abstract theory of who Jesus Christ might be, but a reality of someone that has encountered me, has seen me through and through, and has loved me despite all my weaknesses. So my dear songwriters out there, be custodians of beauty. You're not just songwriters. You're not just composers. You're protagonists of the narrative of love. That's it. That's what it is. Remember that. Hello, and welcome to Music and Mission Sessions, where we explore identity, vocation, and mission through music and conversation. Oh, man, I am really excited for today. Um, before that, quick announcements. Uh, we have a, a cool compilation of the first nine uh, people who shared their uh, prayers, their songs. So if you are able to, uh, after this, of course, uh, click on that in uh, YouTube. Uh, you can just uh, let it play two hours and a half of just beautiful live acoustic prayers. Uh, it's already helped me to uh, stay focused and work. Um, and then also we're all already doing uh, Lent is Underway. We started this uh, desert songs uh, fast or activity uh, to write one line of a song each day and grab two or three people and share it. And it's already been super fruitful with a couple of groups that I know are doing it. So if ever, it's never too late, right? Especially if you haven't uh, done something yet. Yes, thank you, Gabby. I got these new outfits. Thank you to my Valentine who gave me clothes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you are uh, inspired at all or looking for a way to be more prayerful throughout Lent. Uh, man, we have learned over the last uh, six months now that uh, praying through song is one of the most intimate ways to get to explore your relationship with God. Um, amen. Well, I'm super excited. Uh, a little bit of a, a story for those of us who are in the CFC USA family. Um, there was a time uh, where we sang, you know, a lot of Hillsong songs for worship and uh, a lot of different uh uh, contemporary Christian music. And then there was one year, at least from my perspective, where we had this one big conference in California. And then uh, this uh, music ministry just goes up onto this stage. And I'm like, uh, I don't know, maybe 17, 18 at the time. And they say, what we're going to do this year is play songs only written by people in our community, songs and prayers that came from people who went through the same formation and the same camps and the same everything. And so then, oh man, uh, our, uh, our our heads collectively exploded at that moment. Um, and it was just this surge of the Holy Spirit, you know, uh, getting to really pray prayers that were written by people who went through the same experience as me. I think our community never looked back from that moment. And that's why I am super, super, super excited uh, to be able to talk to today. Uh, one of the people who, uh, through the Holy Spirit, allowed that to be possible. He was the writer and co-writer of many, many of those songs. And uh, for those who are uh, in our community, you have definitely, without knowing it, probably worshipped to one of the songs that uh, God has written through him. And so uh, let's just... Uh, open our hearts to the different stories uh, that he has to share with us and uh, to be able to revisit and understand how the spirit really led him to be used by God in that way, to just lead us all into, he said, super times for you. That's how excited I am, Gabby. All right. So let's just welcome, without further ado, to Music and Mission, joining us live from Northern California, playing a mashup of some of his original songs and prayers, Robbie Ocampo. Thank you. 
Amen. Thank you, wow. Robbie. <laughs> uh, let the record reflect. My goodness, it's so real, right? You can practice and, and worship, and then when you're when you're in the presence of, of Christian brothers, there just seems to be this uh, overwhelming feeling of the Holy Spirit that just takes over. I was about to cry there. Gosh, God is so good. Amen. Thank you for uh, starting us off with a worship right at the beginning. <laughs> I'm happy to be one that's that's on Instagram Live. Salutations, friends of God. Happy to be with you. Amen. Yes. Uh, yeah. So Robbie can't see the the comments, but uh, everybody's just, uh, I think, um, same thing as you overwhelmed with definitely the spirit uh, with emotion. Um, and I think uh, something that uh, Tina had mentioned was it's crazy to think as you're going through the songs that you're sharing, how many sure. hearts have been softened over what, like 10 years time or more with each of these prayers. And so I guess that's my uh question just you you took us back through that mashup but going uh, going back uh where did this uh where did these songs come from that's a really great question i suppose we can start from the very beginning pat yeah. my we'll start at the the best day of my entire life <laughs> namely my baptism Ooh. i was as on september 7th as an infant thanks be to god for my mother and my father and my godparents who were there to witness this miracle at hand that was the day that I entered into God's family. And of course, I was young. I don't remember it. But certainly the grace, the fruits of that baptism, of that sacrament, has carried on to this very day. And what's of utmost importance is actually this, this, the, the day thereafter, which is September 8th. September 8th, uh, the church celebrates Our Lady's Nativity. Wow. So now that I'm older... My entire existence, my entire life anticipates her. And why is that important for me as a songwriter? Because I've consecrated and entrusted every single song that I've ever written and every single song that I will ever write into the hands of our mother Mary ad infinitum. From now until I die, any song that I will create, I have made a pledge to Our Lady that all these songs are in her care which is the reason why I believe certain songs have really flourished because when things are entrusted to the Immaculata, they will be led to Jesus Christ. And so a lot of these lyrics, they can be credited to me as the author, as a composer, but really the cause of our joy is that one person who I felt her maternal embrace and her love sweep over me. Every single one of the songs that I've been given the grace to collaborate with the Holy Spirit is inherently Marian. It may not be explicitly Marian, but I have entrusted all of them to her. And it makes sense because we believe as Catholics that Our Lady has assumed body and soul in heaven. Okay, so what's my rationale for that? <laughs> if Our Lady is in heaven, body and soul, that means she has human ears there. She can hear what the angels are singing. Amen. She's the queen of the angels, as one of the titles uh, calls her, the queen of all the angels. So my prayer was when I was younger, Blessed Mother Mary, you are the queen of the angels. You hear the seraphim and the cherubim sing to God Almighty. If there could be an infinitesimal grace, a hint, a glimmer of what they are singing and have that embedded in the songs that I'm invited to write, I know these songs will be used for God's glory because they're in touch with the songs of heaven. And so if people ask, how did this journey begin? I have to say from the outset, I got to let the record reflect that our blessed mother Mary is the driving vehicle by which I have entered the courts of God. She has led me there through these songs, through my own intimacy uh, with, with her son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I'm grateful for her intercession that's so palpable and powerful in my story and in my testimony. Amen. Now, right, as far as, the, as, far as a, a musician proper, mind you, I, I wasn't a wonderkind, right? I was not a prodigy. I was actually <laughs> very, I despise the piano. I mean, as notorious as that sounds, I, I, you know, when I was a, a young boy, my mother coerced me to play. 
And I remember I used to argue and be temperamental and I would tender excuse after excuse saying, <laughs> why, uh, why would I want to do that? I just want to play video games, right? Yeah. <laughs> it was my mom. And, and I learned, of course, fundamentals and basics. But when things began to truly shift for me in my, in my pilgrimage, right, was when I was invited to play for Holy Mass when I was 12 years old. Wow. When I was mm-hmm. over 13 years old, they needed a pianist at my local parish at St. John's in Milpitas. And I said, yes, I was a mediocre player at best. I was amateur. I wasn't impressive. People would listen to me and they wouldn't, they wouldn't turn an ear, <laughs> but I didn't to do so. And here's the secret. I believe now that I'm in hindsight is that every Sunday I would receive our Lord in the Eucharist. I would receive him in the word and I would receive him in the Eucharist. And in so far as I was able to be nourished by God, he was also at the same time simultaneously unlocking the mysteries of the piano. And so what I didn't know when I was going through the basics and fundamentals, all of a sudden were making sense to me. It was, it was, it, I, I could see chords coming together. I didn't have to look at the sheets anymore. It just seemed to come from my spirit. And I attribute that obviously to our God who had this plan this whole time. And he has been so good to me because insofar as I've been able to serve him, he's poured and bestowed treasure after treasure. I can't claim it as my own, certainly not, but it's a gift that I am called to steward with responsibility and purity of heart and purity of intention. Amen. That's beautiful. I love, um, uh, Gabby, even before you began sharing your testimony, already said, I love the Marian imagery. And now it's clear it's it's more than just uh, decorating your room. There's been a lifelong uh, devotion to Mama Mary. Um, I, I think I was captured when you said... Uh, because I'm, I always want to, especially in mass. I, I, my prayer is like, oh man, I, I wonder what it sounds like. If I could hear heaven, what would it sound like? And I love that, the the prayer you were led to sort of flips that. It's, it's not so much, what can I? Let me hear heaven. It was, uh, Mom Mary, what do you hear in heaven? I know that you can hear heaven. That's, man, that's really beautiful. Certainly, I mean, she is the greatest saint of all time, right? She's, a, she's the greatest saint of all time, and, and she is the queen of the angels. And I suppose it would. not it wouldn't be unreasonable to infer or intuit that our lady who has human body and soul in heaven, not just soul, right? She's there assumed into heaven that she could hear what they're saying. And this humble servant from Mulpitas in Northern California asking his mother, Hey, blessed mother, can you, uh, you know, maybe pray for me that I'll be able to, to be able to wire that circuitry so that my ears can be attuned to what people are seeing to your son, because I want that to be on earth, right? I'm not thinking just about earthly impact uh, or generational impact, but eternal impact. Let's, let's create songs that express the heart's desire that can lead people closer to divine intimacy with he who is truth. That is to say, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, beautiful. So you have this foundation uh, from the outset rooted in mass, rooted in a, uh, a loving discipline from your mom <laughs> to force you to go. I mean, and then, not, when I was, I was, I was a curmudgeon, right? I was, I was young. I was, uh, I said, mom, I don't want to go to, to piano lessons, but thanks be to God for that because it laid the foundation from which to spring to utilize his charism for the glory of God. Right. And now that, and so that foundation is laid out. And then when upon that foundation begins the, this building of a songwriting. Ah, that's a great question. Okay. So Pat, uh, I had the good fortune of not being successful at songwriting early on. (laughs) (laughs) I was not someone who was overnight success. It took hard work and dedication to the craft And what I came to realize was that God is in the business of making me new. He's in the business of making me completely and totally healed and human, fully human, fully alive. So the reason why I say it's a good fortune that I wasn't successful at songwriting early on uh, is because I noticed that in the times in which I struggled with lyrics, with melodies, with chords, with structure, with trying to voice what, what my heart has experienced, when I wasn't given those opportunities to write those things down or create and finalize a song, God was in fact building virtue. He was creating opportunities for me to be patient, 
to persevere in love and in fidelity to God, who I knew was going to come through. It was just a matter of my patience and my time because God doesn't lie. I mean, he great is his faithfulness uh, ad infinitum. Like it's not going to end. So thanks be to God because the seasons of drought, I've experienced that. So if there are songwriters out there that have seasons of drought where you don't know, I remember I wrote a song called God of Your People. And that song uh, took about a year and a half to write. I had nothing for a year and a half, but I was faithful to God because those moments where I realized that I had to encounter what it means to be in those seasons of drought. So as to really uh, know what the fullness of, 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 of God's riches are, right? So I'd fast and really quickly uh, for the songwriters out there, uh, be sure to fast, right? So why, why do we fast? Right. We fast because we have a famished vision of the feast. And so the fast mm. is always in service is always a servant of the feast because our imaginations have been lulled to the feast. And so by fasting, waiting for him, praying together, interceding, songs were birthed. And I, I don't know how it happened, but I can say it's been God's grace. Right. But I remember ever since I was young, just back to your question, Pat, ever since I was a young lad. I would buy these CDs, right? I'm not sure if, if people know what CDs are anymore. Oh, what is that? Stage <laughs> in the '90s, we had great music in the '90s. I was a '90s kid, so we listened to old school hip hop and old school R and B. I would go to the local store. I would buy these CDs from Brandy and Monica. And what I would do, I wouldn't listen to the songs first and foremost, Pat. What I would do, uh, I would take the CD jacket out, and I would read who wrote the song oh, whoa yeah i don't know why i did that but that memory is so vivid it's so visceral and it's only now that i can see in hindsight why that was a foretaste of what god was leading me toward so uh the songs in the very beginning <laughs> were not very great my first song that i ever wrote for our lord was a song called soul of gold it's a b-side song you're, ne you're never gonna hear it pat <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it's 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 certainly it's certainly uh, a song that I have in the vault because that's where God has led me. And he has perfected me not only uh, day by day uh, to be a man of virtue, but then also to be a man of discipline to wait on the Lord, especially when the lyrics don't come, when the melody doesn't come, when it's easy to just give up, to say, Lord, these are your songs. Lead me to the promised land. I know you're faithful to me. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's, I, I love that you are, uh, admitting or uh, at least uh, showing that it, it wasn't uh, that you are not a child prodigy of uh, no. you know that it, it's far just from it. <laughs> far, far from it I, I wish i was but at the same time I don't, because this is a christian life right like a lot of us are on this journey of sanctity and sainthood and it takes time saint peter julian amard says this that he says a sure sign of holiness is the willingness to grow in it slowly so too with a music minister, so too with a worship leader, so too with a songwriter, right? Sometimes you have to enjoy that the process is taking time because God is developing not only your perfection and love, but also virtue so that you can receive, you're in the posture to receive the richness of the feast. Amen. There's some people who want to hear those B-side tracks. <laughs> I don't know what, where you're from. I mean, <laughs> certainly these are not for Spotify. This is not for... Apple Music. This is goodness gracious. <laughs> but thank you for your charity. I wish I could read the comments. I, I'm sure that there's many lovely people out there. I, I love you guys. I really love the community, and I'm believing in the best in all you custodians of beauty. Amen. Um, I, I would love to sort of explore uh, when the songs start to uh, really uh, feel feel right um, is it okay if before that we we uh, revisit some of those songs again and then talk about uh, how those songs really started taking shape uh, in you of course yeah so I'll, I'll pass it back to you to lead us into a uh, another worship sure
Yeah, in his presence there's fullness of joy I just you know joy is really infectious is it not gosh god god is so good thanks be to god praise god yeah there the joy that you are exuding i think is definitely uh infectious so i've been <laughs> smiling so much <laughs> you no know, joy is not a flimsy thing joy is a weapon indeed is it not when a Christian is living the joyful Christian life, my goodness, that is infectious. And the world can be, uh, can be inspired, overwhelmed by such beauty exuded in and through witness. So 
uh, remember that, friends of God, that joy is uh, joy is more than just an emotion. It's, it certainly is a weapon. Amen. And I think too that that joy is a. Uh, is uh, emanating off of the songs you just shared. And so I, that's where I'm curious from what you uh, claim to be uh, B-sides and, and some rough songs to now joy-filled, spirit-filled songs. Uh, when, did the, when did the shift begin to happen? Sure. So, uh, okay, some context for you. So I'm from Northern California, from the Bay Area. There might be some Bay Area friends of God that are in the chat. Salutations, friends. Okay. When I started in ministry, I was in community. I graduated from my camp in 2000. And when I started serving for retreats, I had no desire whatsoever to be a part of music ministry. (laughs) My heart was being a discussion group leader. That's where it was for me. Even if I had the charism, even if I had the gift at that time to offer, there were still so many musicians that could lead music men. I had no desire to do that. But it was only when I began to pass the torch to the next generation that I relinquished my leadership position as the area head for my cluster, for my chapter. And I said, "Okay, God, I have this free time now. What is it that you want us to do? Now, when I was leading uh, very actively, we would have meetings every Friday and I was I would be 16 or 17 years old, Pat. And there would be uh, fraternal teasing that would happen from other areas, right? They would go to us and say, you know, you guys, you guys sound great, but you don't have a band. Because back then we had a beatboxer, my best friend, big brother, Ryan, he would be on the mic, spitting the flow. And then we have, we have uh, my friend, Stacy, who was a singer. And then my buddy, Nathan, who was also another beatboxer. So it was just a team of four. That was our music ministry. We didn't have the, the rush of, of, of a full team. So I remember those, those, uh, those moments whereby I was teased by, of course, in, in fraternal jests, of course. But I remember I had a prayer in my heart. I said, Lord, as the next generations come, I pray that we will be supplied with music ministers who understand and analyze music and understand the imaginative process of incarnating songs so we can write things together and we can lead worship for our tiny little home here, our local church in in San Jose. And in 2007, God answered that prayer. In that time, we had a lot of young people, like my goddaughter, Roselle Gatdula, and she might be on the chat. I don't know. She might be. Uh, So my my other godson, Eddie Son, Daly, and so just kids. They're 15, but they had a desire for music. And so how it all started, Pat, was with one song that no one knows about except for the area back at home. And it's a song called Declare by Faith. It's called a song called Declare by Faith. And when I wrote that song, that was the first song that catapulted the desire to explore and to discover all the more what it means to be a worship leader dedicated in pursuit of of God, of God's heart. But I think that the, the first song that really changed it for me on a national level was For You Make All Things New. That was it. And when I presented this to our team of storytellers back at home, that was our, that was our band name. That was our, our music ministry name, the storytellers. The storytellers. When I, when I shared it with a team, I said, guys, I had this very rudimentary song. It's very elementary. It's, it's okay, right? It's all right. And uh, just about a stone's throw away from where I am is where I wrote the song for You Make All Things New, right wow. here. Wow. And I was envisioning all the youth entrusted to my care. And I said, Lord, we need a song to sing. What do you want? And patiently I wait, boom, patiently I search. Okay, for the God who sees, all right. Me for all my worth, okay, that sounds good. But I thought it was just simple poetry until the night that we shared it to the team. We were in a house and all the youth were gathered in a circle of about 10 people, 10 to 11 people, Pat. And I said, guys, we're gonna sing a new song. There's no projector, there's no transparency, but we're gonna do it. Do you guys remember, for, for, my, for my friends of God that are probably in SFC or maybe in CFC now, we used to have projectors and transparencies. Transparencies. <laughs> but we didn't have that. We just had the spirit to lead us. And I would shout out the lyrics and they would sing. And we did it for the first time live in that living room. And the spirit fell upon that house. People were crying. Uh, my best friend Ryan was crying right next to me. It was, it was, it was amazing. It, and I think I know the reason why, Pat, this song has touched a lot of people's hearts. Revelations 21, five says, behold, I make all things new. It does not say 
behold, I make a new thing. That is to say that God would just discard us because we're damaged goods. That's not how God is, right? He works with us in our frailty and our fragility. The scriptures say, I will rebuild the ruins. And so I think when people sing the song, something is happening interiorly that has them understand their identity and their nobility, that they're not going to be damaged goods despite their sin, despite their brokenness, despite their fragmentedness, that they're worthy to be pursued and worthy to be found in the eyes of God who makes all things new and walks with us throughout the entire pilgrimage. So I I think that's probably the reason why, at least that's in my analysis of of how God is, has really worked that song. uh, That's, that's been what, what has been palpable to me. Yeah. Amen. I I think what is, uh, crazy to me is hearing you really describe with so much conviction how the prayer came about and then the moment where the spirit really put a stamp on it and i think uh and i uh, you know i'm blessed to have at least uh uh seen you sing it but there's generations who uh you know it's removed now from the these stories that you're sharing but the the prayer and the effect that the spirit has through that song is really that same first prayer from what 11 more years ago, but it's, it was so clearly the spirit saying, this is what I'm going to use that prayer for. And there are people that, uh, you know, generations removed who are experiencing that same prayer through a song from 10 years ago. Oh, certainly. And what's interesting for, for this, the songwriting process for me is, is that, I would never share a song national if it if it didn't soar at home. So a lot of the songs that you hear that have that have been heard on a national scale, I suppose, those songs were first tested at home, right? So St. Paul says you got to test the spirit, you got to discern it. <laughs> so I wouldn't want to nationally if it can't soar in my community at home. It doesn't make any sense to me, right? I don't want to take that risk. I want to be sure that God is really moving us slowly but surely methodically to the promised land. And then knowing that I have a firm resolve that it's ready to be released for other ears to hear. So that's been my practice that I wouldn't share songs. So uh, I would share songs unless they would be heard by hear, by ears from home. And if it, if it touches their hearts, if it is used in worship enough where people are free and, and, and worship is, is, uh, uh, the sound of the sound of worship is is really just blazing throughout the room. Then I know that it's a time to to share it with with other people. I mean, that's how that's I suppose uh, that's how "Live for You" happened as well. Uh, uh, "Live for You." Maybe some of you guys have heard this song. I am I'm, I'm flabbergasted at how what, what happened. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted because we we didn't have any intention for it to to really reach hearts in that way that it has. So the story behind the song, okay, 2010, I was leading with my dear friend, Patrice, Patrice Posadas. She is uh, my dear friend. Maybe she, she's there out there, but I love you, Patrice. She and I were counterparts for a very long time in music ministry. So we were leading team that year and our full-time worker was Kiko. You know, Kiko? Yeah. <laughs> of course. Forget Kiko. He's such a gem. So I love Kiko. So we have, we're praying and we say, guys, we're going to do all original songs this year. So uh, we invited the team. We invited AJ, Patrick Rizal, all these other friends of God. I said, guys, write songs and then send it through email to us. And then we'll figure out when we're there on site to see if certain songs can fly with us. We'll test the spirit. We'll see that if we're, if it works in corporate worship with the full-time workers with the team, then we'll, we'll make it fly at conference. So we're there first night. And I said, guys, we should write a, we should write a fast song with a whoa. Right. Let's do a fast song. <laughs> so I was there with our friends of God, with the fellow music ministers, and I was just on the guitar. And I was like, "How about this, guys? How about Savior, ah, Mighty and Power? Okay, cool. Blessed Redeemer." Right? So it just it flowed, it flowed. Uh, and then, "Oh Holy Spirit." So what's interesting, Pat, is that you know how the song goes, "Oh Holy Spirit." That wasn't the first suggestion. Actually, what was first brought forth was "Holy Spirit." Right. But our mm. drummer. No, 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 that just sounds funny. You need a little break. So we're going, ooh, oh, Holy Spirit. So that's the, that's the story behind how that Holy, oh, Holy Spirit was manifested. Yeah. So we had the first part of the verse, all right? We just had the first part of the verse. 
And so all the girls left because we didn't sleep in the same home. The guy stayed in the main house. And I was, I was, uh, I was up all night with AJ, Randy Boy, and Eddie Son. And guy, I said, guys, we need a bridge. I mean, we need a, we need a pre-course. And so we're up for about three hours trying to figure it out. We came up with, um, and we will not be shaken. She won't have, like, oh, that's cool. But we had no course, no course at all. The next day, Kiko arrives, right? Kiko Malunas arrives. And when Kiko arrives, we share with him the song. And then Jules, Jules Roberto, I think he was leading conference that year. And so he was just very mindful. Like, okay, we got to make sure that we're praying about the songs, we're discerning about them, mm-hmm. we're fasting. And we shared with him what we had. And he's like, yeah, that's good. That's good. But we had no course. And so here comes Kiko Malunas, right? He comes in and he says, guys, what about that course that I wrote for that other song that I sent in preparation for this conference, right? Because we were asked to write songs and then send them via email. So we took that chorus that, from his song and we incorporate it in Live For You, and now Live For You is Live For You. What's Amen. interesting, you, you talk to Kiko, uh, Pat, you say, hey, so I heard that there's a song called Live For You with the chorus, but it's not the right verse. There's a, there's a different type of melody. It's probably embedded in, in our email somewhere back in our Gmails or, or whatnot. But it's really interesting, right, to hear, to hear these stories about these songs. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, yeah, for your... Uh, for your uh information uh live for you uh when you ask have have anybody heard it before uh in our day like now that you're near in one way these were songs that default are like one of the fast songs in a worship and live for you has become the default anthem of no. us uh, yeah stop. stop right now are you serious yeah tina said no, um <laughs> i'll go ahead <laughs> A long time it's it's but i had to revisit it for for today's worship it's, it's been a while since I've, I've visited that song and it's nice to revisit an old friend that's awesome i i love uh you've just been describing this whole time this very very communal uh process um i think it resonated with so many people and myself too when you said there's this testing of the spirit that has to happen at home i think um even myself uh we only see the the fruit and so when i saw you uh, many many years ago and and the whole music men saying here are all these songs in, in my head unfortunately i think okay whenever there's a national thing we can just write songs and, and put it out there and i'm i am I am uh, humbled to hear that every single song that even that moment that I at the very start said that really changed, I think, the face of what's possible in community with with worship and music and to to really hear uh, unequivocally or, or definitively that these are songs that either they came from worshiping at home with the your chapter with the people you grew up with, or they came from this process of let's share, let's, uh, let's pray about them. Let's test these songs and worship together first and then see where it leads. And I think that's such a a powerful and humbling thing to see that, uh, songs that are made for worship need to be tested and, and shared first in a place of worship. I think actually that's what happened within your heart too. I didn't, I didn't think in your, cause that, that conference for 2010, we did in your heart for Friday night, I think reflection. And that was not going to be the song for it until Pat Rizal changed it. So do you know Pat, Pat Rizal? Yeah. You know, okay, so he's from SoCal. I love you, Pat. It's been a while. I miss you, bro. It's been 10 years since that conference. Thanks be to God. But uh, so when I wrote that song in your heart, it was just in your heart first, first, and the planted me your holy seeds. Okay. I, I had it tested with my sister so my sister chelsea she is the person that will be very honest with me she'll say hey that song is is lackluster at best or this song is definitely brilliant let's go ahead and uh, share this with the team so i shared i asked her in your heart what do you think she says yeah it's great so i brought it to the team i brought it to patrice first she sang it and there was there was a movement to it we thought that there had some potential but it was a really short song right in your heart first one and then planting me of course and that's it until 2010 conference. So <laughs> Pat Rosal, one of the evenings, our practice was every single music minister would share a song that has touched their hearts to the depths and share the story behind why they chose that song and how that related to their encounter. So people chose Beautiful Lord, people chose other songs from like Hillsong songs. But Pat that night said, hey, I'm gonna be doing In Your Heart. I said, wait, 
what? We just, <laughs> that song is just written. It's still fresh. He says, no, 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 no. I want to do this song. It's really moved me. I said, okay. But he said, Robbie, is it okay if I share with you something? I said, yeah, certainly. He says, well, I wrote a second verse to it. I said, oh, that's great. So here comes Pat. And he's singing in your heart, verse one and the chorus. And then he adds his second verse. In your heart, I will see love and peace. In your heart, I will see the Holy Spirit in me. In your, in your heart, I will find a temple. Right? Those, those lyrics. And the whole team was so astounded by how the Holy Spirit moved in and through uh, Pat's, Pat's heart. And we did it that night. It was confirmed for us that that would be the reflection song for 2010. Wow. That is, that is crazy. I think it, it, um, it affirms a lot of, uh, what praise God we've been led to do here, which is, uh, creating that space to, to share songs and prayers and, and even to share fragments of prayers. I think that's, what's been really, uh, a unforeseen discovery of like uh, music and mission is, uh, especially in this very individualistic music, uh, era where I, I just, like me here in my room at my desk with the full production thing. I do it until it's as complete as I can be. And then I just throw it out there into the ether. And I think what's been beautiful to, to rediscover and then to hear that, that that's the very practice that you had is this sharing these incomplete and not perfect and not necessarily polished prayers. And then other people even taking their own prayer and their own heart and putting it together. And there's this very communal uh, process to it. It's not just a, a, a by myself in my room thing. And then I put it out there and become famous. It's sharing hearts with people and the prayers build from that. And that was one of the things that we, we discussed with music men that I've led in the past is that our object as worship leaders, as songwriters is not for legacy. It's not for celebrity. It's not for, um, any of any of those things that are of material work, it's really about the heart of God. It's about the heart of our Lord. So for all the songwriters out there, just keep in mind that your aim, your object, and your motive of your entire service ought to be intimacy with Jesus Christ. That ought to be it. And if you've been given and granted the charism of music by goodness, uh, steward that with great responsibility, with purity of intention and purity of heart, because I've noticed, Pat, that in this line of service, it's so easy to convince yourself of your own excellence. And if that happens, the ancient seduction lies in wait for you, pride, right? So it's very important that we continue to examine our hearts and investigate the reasons why we do what we do, because one of the hard lessons that I've had to learn as a music minister is that your charism doesn't guarantee virtue. Right. Your ability to write songs is not commensurate to a truly holy life. You can write a, a bunch of amazing worship songs, but you could have a lousy, sinister heart. I mean, that's that's not what we're called to do. There needs to be a unity between both uh, the, the desire to, to share, of course, the charism uh, with others and to use it for God's glory, but also the motivation to become a saint. Right. To become uh, holy by virtue of the grace that's provided in our pilgrimage here on earth. So uh, maybe that might be of, of, of good advice for certain friends of God that are out there that are thinking, okay, how do I, how do, I do that? Um, and that's the one thing that I've had to learn time and time again, that I have to check myself before I wreck myself. <laughs> and if I, was in a, I was not in a state of, if I was not in a state of grace, I, would not be, I wouldn't put myself out there to lead people into worship. I just, I just felt like the responsibility for our young people is so great. And I, I want to prepare as much as I can, uh, both mentally, spiritually, physically, to, to be my best for our Lord, so as to use uh, my gifts for his glory. Amen. That, uh, yeah, there's a bunch of people who are, you're saying you should write a book. <laughs> or, uh, <laughs> yeah, when you say, uh, was that useful? And I think that resonates so loud to music ministers. Um, the one thing I want to share with you is, uh, as you share this creative process and this prayerful, fasting, collaborative, uh, testing process uh, to create these songs. Um, and then you share about the, uh, every night, everybody would share a song that touched them to the depths of their heart. And then I was, a I'll go. Song. Regular song. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, the next year I was part of Music Men and then it's been a tradition where if you're preparing for music, man, I, ideally you have this acoustic night and exactly that same practice got passed down. And I think that uh, solidifies for me 
it's not just the the songs that were passed down in the praise of the songs, but it was how you did it. And it's exactly what you said. It was, it, it's the, not just the, the fruit itself, or the, you could write a bunch of incredible songs, but if how you did it uh, was like you said, sinister or prideful, or it's, that will taint sort of the, uh, the full gift that is uh, the song. It's not just the song. So uh everything that you mentioned, the prayer, the fasting, the sharing it with other people, the, the humility, uh, I, I affirm you in that there are ways that I have experienced not just the song, but the passing down of how to go about these things also spreads through generations. Of course. Yeah, certainly. I mean, for me, there's, there's nothing more heartbreaking, Pat, than an unconvincing Christian life. We have to ask ourselves, friends of God, those who are out there in Instagram land, two questions. <clears throat> what does a life look like that's been completely overtaken by the Christian event? Number two, what does a life look like that's been completely and utterly won over by Jesus Christ? And does your heart exude that reality, right? Does your profession of faith match your witness? And does your witness match your profession of faith because the young people to whom we are entrusted, they will look to us as the location of the hypothesis. That is to say, they're going to verify whether or not the fruits of us who claim to be Christian, right, is truly exuding in and through an indestructible gladness that is witnessed in and through how we act, how we live. And if that claim, the most attractive proposal known to mankind, that is to say Christianity, if that claim is so alive in our hearts, right, or if it's rendered sterile, if it's reduced to mere intellectual discourse, right? There has to be an encounter, there has to be an event. And so it's important for us as music ministers, particularly that we remember uh, that a saint in the concrete always supersedes a saint in the abstract, right? You could be a saint in your mind. You can pretend that Jesus is, 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 is your number one, your go-to, but perhaps those actions and who we are as people don't exude that reality and that's a lot of times the reasons why people fall away from the church because of poor witness. And so it's important that we don't create a facade, of course, but then can it be possible that I could truly live an authentic human life that exudes an indestructible gladness uh, that confirms the most beautiful hypothesis that Christ came down, he died for me to set me free, that I was worthy of being pursued, that I was worthy of being found, and that he has seen me through and through, right? That God can do that for me. And they verify that with our very lives. So for those who are out there, uh, you know, just, just continue to, of course, fight the good fight, but then music can't be a first love, right? It can't be a first love. It has to be a second love. Christ has to be the first. I actually, I went to a life team retreat in Georgia, Pat. Nice. Yeah. And Matt Marr, Matt Marr was supposed to be the worship. He was supposed to be the, the retreat leader. But then that was a time where he was, he released Alive Again, right? So that was with Your Grace is Enough. I think that was Your Grace is Enough. But Garden was in there. A lot of great songs from Matt Moore. He couldn't go last minute. So he sent us an email, all the participants. And that's what he said to us. He said that you are sons and daughters first, first your disciples second, and your ministers third. Make sure that, you know, music is a good thing, but it can't be a first love. Christ has to remain our aim object and motive and that reality has to exude in and through who we are in our actions and our witness from the inside out not as a facade not to fake the funk but as people who are truly authentically alive who have tasted and seen the sweetest taste amen i feel like we could just end it right there but i don't think <laughs> we should <laughs> but yeah uh, praise God is so good. And uh, the reason why I do this still is not because I, I feel compelled to uh, for any other reason, except for the glory. I feel like worship, worship is like the only response, right? It's the most feasible response. It's the most appropriate response to the most attractive proposal known to mankind. And I want my life to be all about that. Uh, even if I may not have the ability to play, like just to make my life uh, an example of what it means to be truly alive in Jesus Christ, to be conformed to him, to have his image etched and um, onto mine. Amen. Yeah. You're you, I think that uh, 
it's clear what you said, it's etched into your life. And so uh, as much as uh, I would love to keep exploring these songs that uh, as we have uncovered, we've only even talked about three songs, but for another time, I, th I think I have to ask a question that uh, maybe many of us do have is uh, this uh, life that you're living, this Christian life, uh, has it now, 10 years later or 11 years, however long uh, now we are from that beautiful uh, spirit-led burst of songs that you shared uh, in these mashups. But uh, where has that taken your uh, faith life and especially your songwriting life? Are you still writing songs? Yes. Yes, I am. Uh, indeed. Uh, one thing <laughs> that I've come to realize deeply and most profoundly is how loved I am by him, by our Lord. I've noticed that insofar as I'm able to capture, of course, not comprehensively, but to the degree that I'm able to even capture how deep and vast God's love is for me, that has in some sense permeated and penetrated the reality of my songs as well. My songs have, I feel like the songs have gotten better insofar as my identity has been established in Christ, not in popularity, not in celebrity, not in legacy, but in him. So after 2010, that was, I believe that was my last, well, no, in 2012, I was part of Full of Grace for a little bit, but really quickly, uh, for all the generations that came thereafter, I was so impressed and so moved by the great songs that came thereafter. I remember in 2011, I got this text from Chico I believe his name is Sebastian. He wrote this wonderful song yeah. and I was moved by it. And then of course, Pat, I know you may not want me to talk about this, but <laughs> I'm going to talk because I tell this to you every single time, right? I tell you this every single time we, we, we talk, we talk, but in, was it 2014? When, when did you write Victorious? Uh, <clears throat> 2011. 2011. And when did you share it with community? 2012? Uh, no, same year. Oh, 2011. I got... I think it was either from Gian Santayana or from Kiko, but it says, Hey, you got to hear this new song from Patrick Cornell. I said, yeah, absolutely. And so they shared with me a live version of your song victorious. And can I tell you, I was absolutely moved by your song. And I just want to affirm you for continuing this great tradition of listening and being in a posture of receptiv receptivity to receive uh, songs from heaven, because that song uh, has, has really touched my heart. I was listening to it the other day and just, gosh, this is such a brilliant song. So uh, tip of the cap to you, Pat. Wow. Thank you. I was not <laughs> expecting this, but. Well, oh. it's okay. You know, like it's, I mean, we're just having, a, you know, any comments. I feel like it's just a conversation between you and me. So I'm not intimidated by any of the comments that might be popping up. You might be seeing them and they might be affirming with thumbs up. Yay, go Pat. But I'm, I'm, I, I really, I really love your music, brother. I'm, I'm grateful for what you're doing here. Oh, God is good. I am overwhelmed in the best of ways. Right. Uh, well, uh, before we uh, keep going about sort of your, the your where your heart is now as far as songwriting, maybe it's best to just uh, show it first. So, is, is there a, a new song you're going to share with us? Yeah, I could, I could share with you a song called Augustine. So my patron saint is St. Augustine and St. Padre Pio. And I relate very much to St. Augustine. And he's not only uh, the doctor of the church, he's brilliant, uh, but I also relate to a lot of the things that he's written about in his confessions. And I, I believe that this song, this, this song that I'm going to share, the, the chorus was written in 2012 and the song was completed in 2019, 2019. Oh, wow. So it took a long time. It was, I, I, I was playing with, I was like, oh, there's nothing here. And then finally, uh, in patience, God was able to reveal this entire song. So it's about St. Augustine and it's about how we should never forget our BC life. Uh, that the things that we've gone through, that what we've experienced, right? The, the metallic taste of emptiness, right? The shiver of something missing. We ought not to forget that experience of what it was like uh, to have life without Christ, because it makes it all the more richer and sweeter to remember how we've been saved, how we've been pursued, and um, how grace has captured us once again. So this song is called Augustine, and I hope you guys like it. Amen. Take it away. Thank you. 
listen it out. You've given us all that you are. All that you are. You've given us all that you are. Oh, Lord. You quell the restless heart. You satisfy the aching and pacify the groaning of my soul. Thank you, Robbie, for sharing that. I, I am. Uh, I'm really curious. You mentioned the the chorus was written 2012, and then it, it wasn't a, a fully complete until seven years later. And, and I know you have already talked so much about uh, all of these building blocks for songwriting, patience, fasting, collaboration, uh, this this relationship with the Lord. But uh, I guess uh, I, you know. I know a lot of people, uh, myself included, who songwriting, like you said, there are droughts of songwriting, or it just feels like sometimes songwriting was a time in our life, and, and it, we may feel detached from the talent, but what keeps you going after 11 years, and a song like that, it takes seven years to write it? Right. Um, I, I experienced my poverty. And experiencing my poverty, I went through experiences whereby I realized uh, in my purification, the ways in which I was not perfected in love and the ways in which I was encouraged to love more so like Jesus Christ. So I believe the reason why a song like that took so many years to finish is because I wasn't ready to receive it. I was not in a place of conversion to receive it. 
St. Ambrose, uh, St. Augustine's uh, mentor, if you will, he says that the human person undergoes two conversions, one born of water and one born of tears. The first one, of course, is baptism. The second one, born of tears, is of repentance. There came a point in my life where I realized and tasted my own poverty and how much I was in need of God. And much of my comfort, too, was recognizing that there are saints, too, that have experienced something similar where they came to the point where uh, they really needed the Lord to sustain them. And St. Augustine, for me, was, was one of those saints. And so reading his confessions, diving into it, I was able to relate to one of the greatest doctors of the church. So I, 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 the reason why I sing, I don't write for writing's sake. I write because I've encountered something. I write because there has been a perfection in love. I write because I could be frustrated sometimes with God and I want his patience and I want perseverance uh, to win me over to believe again that his faithfulness and his fidelity is very real. Because it's easy for me to say this now, now that I'm not in those seasons of desolation, but all of us will go through. But one of, my, one of the great quotes that I've come to, to learn is, the Christian life doesn't make life easier. It makes life more real. That is to say, a deeper immersion into the reality of the cross, but also a deeper immersion into the reality of joy and peace. And so, uh, my prayer from 2010 to where I am now is really quite simple. I just, I, I want to become a saint and not just, I don't want, it's not canonization that I'm seeking for. It's perfection and love that I'm seeking for. And I recognized in 2012, 2015, these other years that I was nowhere near the way in which God loved, that there are still parts of my heart that I coveted, glory, celebrity, right? These are all these things, they mean nothing. Uh, once I was able to encounter God in a more profound way. So my, my writing, uh, what has kept me sustained is, is Jesus Christ and the intercession of his mom, who has not given up on me ever. And so as, as long as I have air to breathe, uh, there's a song to sing. I might write that song. You might write that song. There might be somebody who will write that song, but I will share in that corporate worship to sing it together with you to declare God's goodness in the midst of drought, in the midst of, of crucifixion, so that we can glory in the resurrection. Beautiful. I think you have um, unlocked my mind every uh, you, when you say uh, I wasn't ready to receive it. And I think it just, for me, it, sim it simplifies everything uh, as a songwriter. And, and I've experienced what I felt like was writer's block for three years, but maybe it was more so. Uh, like you said, uh, there is a, a prayer, a song, an encounter uh, that God is trying to initiate. And uh, especially from uh, St. Pope John Paul II's letter to artists, and he talks about these gifts and talents and, and moments of art are divine sparks. They are a gift that God's trying to give, for example, trying to give me. If I am if I am at this, what feels like a wall, the writer's block, and I feel like I can't finish something, maybe it's not that I am, that I am not pounding hard enough, but I, my, my hands are just, not, I'm not ready to receive whatever right. that song is, that prayer, that little encounter, that moment that God has for me. Exactly. And that's, that's so beautiful that you said that, because that's one of the things that I've come to realize as a writer is that it's really about this receptivity posture, right? I have to allow myself to be loved. Now, uh, during grad school, there was this provocative question that was asked to me, Pat. The instructor said, what's more important, to love or to be loved? And uh, mm. everybody thought it's to love, certainly. Love wins, right? We hear this in the culture. <laughs> but he said, no, 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 you're wrong. In fact, to be loved is far more superior. Why? Because you can't give that which you do not have. And it's in my experience of being loved first and foremost that compels me and impels me to love the other. And even in the scriptures, right? The scriptures talk about it in, I believe, the first, first John, that we love because Christ loved us first. And so Christ always makes the first move. So if we're in a season of drought, if there are songwriters out there, they're saying, man, I will never write a song like Pat. I'll never write a song like, uh, like John Monondo, a buddy of mine. <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, be of, be of, uh, be of good cheer. You know, allow yourself to be loved and God will, uh, God will come through for you. That's, that's been the experience time and time again uh, in my history of, of walking this pilgrimage. 
Amen. That is a beautiful wisdom and uh, definitely our collective prayer for everybody listening to be able to be receptive to God's love and then that it manifests not just necessarily in songwriting, but whatever gift. I have a confession to make um, as we uh, move towards the end. Uh, you you uh, recalled uh, opening CDs, whatever those are, and, and opening the pamphlet and seeing the people involved in the songwriting process. Right. I, I, too, in the more digital age, when I would, uh, for example, <laughs> see uh, those songs like uh, For You Make All Things New, and it says, uh, you know, lyrics and, and music by Rabio Campo or whoever else. So I would Google instead of just seeing, I would Google, oh, who's Rabio Campo? And I came across this video on Vimeo which is also uh, a very niche and outdated thing now. <laughs> but it was a little snippet of you giving a talk at a songwriter's workshop years and years ago. And I think I hear the passion with which you uh, encourage and, and, uh, and, and desire for more and more people to write songs and to be open to the Lord moving in this way. I, I guess that's my ultimate question from then until now. Uh, what is, what is the advice? What is the what guidance you have for people who, uh, feel this pull towards songwriting? Mm -hmm. Gosh, there's so many ways I can I can take this, I suppose. <laughs> well. Hmm. Um I'm taking the time just to allow the Holy Spirit to give me the words that are needed to be said, because there's a lot of ways in which I can take this. But what's most fundamental, I believe, is to discover how deeply loved you are by Jesus Christ. I think the greatest songwriters are the ones that have had an encounter that changed them forever. From the shiver of something missing to the fulfillment of every single desire of our human hearts. I can give you advice of how to play, how to sing, how to write, but I feel like those are secondary to what's my most primordial and what's most fundamental and to allow yourself uh, to be loved by Jesus Christ, to discover how deeply loved you are and that Jesus Christ fulfills the deepest desires of the human heart. And what are the desires of the human heart? To be loved, to be affirmed, to be secured, to be safe, to be seen, to be known insofar as you're able to understand that I believe your songwriting will flourish because it's coming from a real concrete place. It's not coming from an abstract theory of who Jesus Christ might be, but a reality of someone that has encountered me, has seen me through and through and has loved me despite all my weaknesses. So my dear songwriters out there, be custodians of beauty. You know, <clears throat> you're not just songwriters. You're not just composers. You're protagonists of the narrative of love. That's it. That's what it is. Remember that, that you're protagonists in this great narrative of love. And what will be your hymn to sing? What will be the song that you can express, not only through words, not through chords, but simply and surely by the gift of your life? Because that will be a song that will echo from eternity. When 10,000 years from now, if the songs will not be played anymore, at least the witness of your life emitted a fragrance that was intoxicating the people that said, that person has a joy that I want. That person has a love that I desire. That person is so secure in who he or she is that I want that too, that freedom to love. So my dear friends, I, I could share with you, of course, me me uh, methods, but they pale in comparison to that. Be the protagonist of the narrative of love that you're called to be. And uh, really quickly before, I know we might be ending soon, Pat, but can I just give credit where credit is due? Yeah, of course. Is that okay? Are we, are we okay on time? Okay. Yeah, you're good. You're good. <laughs> so uh, there are four people that have been major influences in my musical formation. And I, I feel I have to give voice to them, especially in this time. So... There are four people that have been of tremendous impact for me. The first of which 
And the reason why I'm sharing them is because there's something to learn from them as music ministers that I've learned that I want to share with you. <clears throat> the first is a songwriter named John Monongo. So John Monongo is a good friend of mine, and he penned the song Beautiful Lord. Do you guys know, you know that song, Pat? Beautiful Lord? Um, maybe if I hear it. <laughs> this, maybe the community knows that song, but uh, this brother in Christ is someone that I've grown in fellowship with and in fraternity. And I was trying to discern what, why, what was it that he taught me as a music minister, right? When I was 10, 11, 12 years old, these, these figures in the faith who embodied someone who was living out the Christian life convincingly, but also using their gift to glorify God, that is to say their musical gift. And so I just recognize that his particular charism is something that I really wanted to emulate because in this brother's songs, he has an ability to exude an evangelical quality to his songs. Like at first listen, hope springs forth. I've played his song, Beautiful Lord, time and time again in different settings of worship. And instantaneously people, their, their defenses are low, right? It's disarming them because uh, the grace they're in uh, penetrates the, the hardness of their hearts. And I, I've seen youth and young people and young adults come to, to really experience and encounter a Lord by virtue of his song. So I said, well, what is it, what is it about the song that makes it so great? And what I learned from him, Pat, and I, I hope that for the listeners out there that might want to take some advice, maybe this could be the advice section, yeah. is realize that sometimes uh, the profundity is in the simplicity. That is to say, I've come time and time again to, to really make songs of different types of flavors, of different types of modes, but the songs that have really been impactful, at least in my experience, has been the most simple songs, like For You Make, or Confidence, or, I don't know, uh, other songs. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So I, I want to honor him because uh, I stand on others' shoulders that have witnessed beautifully to me. And um, I ought to give them honor for that. The second person is Cat Rubinos Discipolo. Do you know who Cat Rubinos Discipolo is, Pat? Yes. Um, <laughs> I know her husband more so. <laughs> so Kevin is my friend. Uh, Kevin and Cat are married. But I... Uh, she she was never a full-time worker, but she was to me. She was the older sister in the ministry to me. Now, why does this make any sense? Because uh, 2008, I was invited to be a part of a team. This was in Florida. Were you at the Florida conference? Yes, the love conference. All right. <laughs> so this is the backstory, Pat. Uh -huh. said, Saturday night, Yvette is giving the talk. Okay, do you remember Yvette? She's a former full-time worker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And she goes to Kat, she's Kat, this is the worship, this is the reflection song that we got to do for this session. It's ah, cool. She says, cool. And so Kat discerns it. She discerns it. And uh, there was an, a restlessness in her heart. And she approaches me, she says, hey, Robbie, you know, uh, I don't think God is inviting us to do the song that Yvette has chosen. And I said, oh, okay, well, what song do you want to do? What song do you feel God is inviting you to do? And she says, oh, worthy. I said, worthy? So. <laughs> There's a song called Worthy that Kat and I wrote for NorCal. And it really took off. It soared there. And when Kat approached me at that conference and said, hey, can we do Worthy? I had my defenses up like that. <laughs> Why? Because that song required me to sing. And I was not going to sing at some conference, right? <laughs> this is a reflection song. This is not supposed to give them and lead them to Christ, not lead them astray. So I like, can't do this, right? And so what did I do? I made excuse after excuse after excuse, right? In the Bible, Exodus 4.13, Moses says, Lord, send somebody else, right? That's pretty much my posture with, with Kat. I told her, I can't do the song worthy. I don't want to do this. And the reason why I say she's a real one, she's a real sister, is because she was willing to wage war with my pride when she recognized that the facade was truly pride and fear that was motivating and driving my, uh, my arguments. And it came to the point where I had to realize that God was inviting me to take a risk for him. It was either I was going to take a risk or I was not going to take a risk. And I did. And that video is still up today. Yeah. That was the most, that was one of the most scariest, but humbling and fulfilling moments of my life because I took a risk for Christ and that 
change the trajectory of everything. I'm thankful for her. And these, and for us ministers out there, there are those people, right? There are those people that encourage you to write, like Pat, that encourage you to go forward and, and to can continue to, to blaze the trail uh, for, for our Lord. So uh, don't forget about the people that have led you to the place where you are today because God was working in and through them too. Uh, two more people, Pat. Yeah, uh, go for it. Is uh, Tom Park. Do you know Tom Park? Yeah, I was telling you, I know his name, but I that's generations removed from even me. <laughs> So Tom Park, songwriter extraordinaire, back in the early 2000s, he wrote these wonderful tunes, Greatest Gift. You should listen to it. It's The Greatest Gift, uh, Hope in You, Keep That in Mind, uh, Welcome to Heaven. I remember his discography because as a youngster, I would see him on the platform at conferences. He's, he was always the guitarist at conferences. And he, he was so effortless when he sang. And... I didn't have a chance to, to minister with him in, uh, in person, but his, his influence and his impact was so palpable from afar. So I have to give credit where credit is due. I thank you, Tom Park, for uh, your witness and the songs that God has uh, invited you to, to write for his glory. And then finally, uh, the last person of great impact that has been influential in my journey is uh, this man named Raymond Pingoy. Do you know Ray Pingoy? Uh, by name also. <laughs> <laughs> he was a former full-time worker. He was the first person to invite me to be a part of National Band in 2007. And that changed everything for me. And I will never forget his humility and what he's taught me because he was the first man of God that I came to encounter that truly exemplified and exuded what it meant to be um, St. Joseph in the real. So Ray, if you're listening, thank you. Uh, you've done more for me than you probably know. Amen. And let me share with you one on my list. Uh, I think, and for everybody who's who's been listening and, and will listen, uh, Robbie, you really sharing your heart, your passion, and, and your love for Christ. Um, for even people who had never met you, um, the Lord has been using you and your joy and your 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 faith to create an infectious desire to know Christ more, to try to songwrite. You know, I, I just think of people who have maybe only heard of your song, not known you, and still the spirit moved in them. Like, I, I want to write a song like that. You know how many times we have... Uh, gone to songwriting and thought we should add woes. And I just think of that from you just saying that years ago, it's the same spirit of, of creativity and of joyfulness and of having fun with, with friends that is, is so powerful in, in your testimony. And it's just a blessing to be able to like definitively uh, hear it firsthand from you uh, to be able to record it. And, and that I know that you will be on many people's lists. And as you said, that's not the, the reason why you do it, but I know that God is working so powerfully in, in every story that you shared with all of us. Well, thanks be to God. Again, for, for those who are tuning in, I thank you, Pat, for this wonderful opportunity. And for all those that are tuning in, you know, it might be, it might be good for you to listen to the soundtrack, soundtrack of our heritage, right? That is to say, the, the discography of the songs that have led this community from generation to generation. Uh, the Glory Book might be outdated, rightfully so, but there are <laughs> Really wonderful tunes there that it might benefit your ear to hear what songs at a certain time in a concrete place were sung by people that believed that rapid evangelization of families was indeed possible. And it might do you justice to listen to those sound that soundtrack, those songs that have come before us to lead us to where we are now so that you have perspective because it's important that we know not only where we're going, but where we've come from as a music ministry. I can tell you, uh, the vast majority of the songs that we've done on the, uh, from the conferences that I've gone through, uh, listen to, to um, Kuyo Mike Serapio, Kirby, all, all these wonderful songwriters, Bimbo, Yero, I've heard Fearless, absolutely phenomenal. They're, 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 you can just see God's hand upon these writers, right? And even people from the mid-2000s, like Bridget Hermano, listen to Stand by Bridget Hermano. That is a classic song. You just have to give voice because I think what, what happens sometimes is that people forget People, the temptation sometimes is, will people still remember me? Will, mm. Like it's been 10 years, it's been 20 years. Will, still, will people still remember any impact that I could have given to this community through my charisms? And I want to let them know that are out there that may not be in community, active or inactive, 
that you're still remembered, you're still cherished, and you're still so loved by what you've given to this community. Um, from Glory Book to Live Loud, right? We, uh, I just believe that there will be even more for the promised land to come. So keep up the faith, be the saints in the concrete, not the saints in the abstract, and discover what it truly means to be loved, because in that discovery will be the fulfillment of all desire. Amen. Thank you so much, Robbie. This has been an incredibly special, special blessing and I think uh, has set the tone for the rest of my Lent. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so before we end, though, we'll, we'll have a one final song from you. So before we close off in, in prayer with that song, could you just explain a bit of what, what this last song is? Yeah, the song is called In Your Presence. It's a healing song. Uh, my godson, Nico, uh, asked me to lead worship for his his meeting at uh, St. John's at our local parish. And so I was leading worship for him. And then when it was spontaneous praise, uh, there's this bridge that birthed in my spirit. It just came out. And I invited the, peop- the, the people there, the youth, to sing it, and it caught fire. So that this is another example of, of a bridge that was formed at one point in time. But then the verse and the chorus, it came at a later time. A loved one of mine was having surgery on his eye and it was a very intense surgery. Mm. And while he was having surgery, I was writing this song. And then I connected the two because in some sense, they mirror what it means to have God heal the broken heart. So it's a call. It's a song called In Your Presence. Amen. Let's uh, do a prayer before we uh, hear In Your Presence. Yeah. Um, I think uh, the the last thing that sticks out to me before our prayer is Everything you've said, um, Pope Benedict has this one uh, document and and there's this one line that I think just encapsulates everything you've talked about. Uh, Pope Benedict says, when man comes into contact with God, mere speech is not enough. And I just think everything you've been sharing is testament to it's not even enough for us to talk right now. (laughs) So let's just end in a prayer together. name the father and the son and the holy spirit amen Amen. lord god just thank you so much for this uh overflowing conversation father your spirit is truly with us and and i thank you lord for just uh, affirming us you are a spirit of ages what the rock of ages beginning and end really means lord you are working uh, through generations, you are continuing and, and always giving these gifts and these uh, encounters of love. And so, mm-hmm. Father, we just lift up to you all of those um, in community, out of community, uh, who desire to know you more. Uh, Lord God, every person here who uh, has a talent given by you, uh, just open our hearts, Lord, more and more and more to your presence. And we know that, and we've heard, and we are affirmed, and we are reminded that all we really desire is an encounter with you. This we pray. Amen. Every fear, every anxiety, every disease, and all infirmities melt in your love and all is healed in jesus name every lie and insecurity conquered by truth restores identity and I am found and I am known and loved by you you rebuild the fractured fragments of my heart you announce the time of jubilee You pursue me so that you can restore me back to life. You renew the strength of those who are weak. 
weary You draw near to every broken heart You pursue me so that you can restore me back to life Lord God, you make all things new, Lord. We're open and receptive to your love, an in- 
infinite love that has no boundaries, Jesus. We know that in your presence, there is fullness of joy. In your presence, there is healing. Free.